Hello and a very warm welcome to Reigate and Redhill Choral Society's Christmas Carols 2020. This is a recording with a real difference. It was put together at breakneck speed on the 3rd of November for the benefit of all our members and loyal supporters who aren't able to be with us in person for our usual Christmas concerts and festivities. We're missing you immensely and hope this video will demonstrate that the heart of RRCS is still beating strongly. It was thrilling and a little hair raising to plan and execute the recording session so quickly. We're just so grateful to everyone who was able to take part at such short notice, less than 12 hours in many cases. Particular thanks are due to our music professionals, Paul Bendel and Charles Thompson. Our sound and video team, David Lake and Richard Salmon, who worked so hard on the day and have done a brilliant job of editing over the past month. To our three guest singers, Alicia Pettit, Sherilyn Rennett and Gordon Tyerman. Our COVID compliance team, Tim Nelson, Nigel and Sue Riddell, And also Buzz Shrewsbury and Philippa Weeks for their research and readings. Sarah Ashworth as ever with the St John's Church team were hugely hospitable. And our committee members were all unwavering in their support and encouragement right from the outset. Our singers rose to the occasion magnificently, despite the drawbacks of singing through masks and distance from our fellow choristers. Time was really short, but the level of focus and concentration on the music and instructions was quite exhilarating to be part of. So congratulations to everyone involved. I'm really proud of what we achieved. I hope you enjoy watching and listening now. And if you'd like to support our continuing work next year, you can donate through our website and we're sharing profits from this recording between our local food bank charity and our own membership fee bursary fund. Merry Christmas everyone and my warmest wishes for a safe, happy and healthy 2021. Good evening. My name is Cole Bendel, and for the past term I've had the privilege of working with the Rygate on Red Hill Choral Society as their acting conductor. We've had the opportunity to look at festive seasonal Christmas music, and our original plan for this December had been to present some kind of history of carol singing, the pretty basic premise being bringing in poetry and text and histories of so many of the wonderful tunes that we love singing this time of year. We had hoped to share this with a large audience, and then, of course, um, another cancellation, another lockdown, another sudden change of plans. This has been the story of our year. As so many choirs and amateur music makers have found across the country, we've had this simple experience of having to put the music on hold a bit, to cancel rehearsals, to cancel concerts, and some amazing experiences to do what is right for our community right now, which is to make sure that we're keeping ourselves protected and indoors. And while this has been sad and depressing, uh, we found ways to make light of the situation and have fun in the situation. Over the course of this past year, members have been treated to online Zoom sessions, sing-alongs, and yes, that most shocking of thing, even live rehearsals, again, taking place under socially distanced uh, rehearsal restrictions and making sure we're following all COVID compliant guidelines. We miss rehearsing in our typical format daily. We miss performing in our regular format daily. And we hope that 2021 brings uh, really positive changes and opportunities to bring our kind of music back. In the meantime, however, we did need to present something. And over the course of a 48-hour period, members of the committee and individual singers from Red Hill Rygate Choral Society came together to record the carols you're going to see tonight. These are a variety of carols that we felt really stress the importance of the season. That were something that we can put together in the most time pressure of situations. Over the course of one day, not even that, maybe closer to around about two and a half hours, um, a group of singers and friends came together to make music. And in a wonderful setting, we were able to produce something which has been engineered and presented for you to experience tonight. 
We're really grateful for the support of everyone on our committee that made this possible, the individual singers who gave up time on the weekday to come along and sing this, um, and for everyone that has continued to support the efforts of the Red Hill and Rygate Choral Society over the course of a really challenging uh, year. Um, if you feel inspired by what you have seen tonight, if you feel inspired to support us further, then please consider a donation to our cause. Um, you can do so by visiting our website. In the meantime, uh, the, we begin our festivities with a gentle piece by John Rutter, The Nativity Carol. He wrote this in 1963 while still a student. Uh, barely out of his teenage years, he writes this really serene piece for choir and organ that just contemplates the intimacy of the nativity scene.
Hello everybody. Well, like you, I've been singing Christmas carols now for many years. In my case, it's virtually 70 years. And during the summer, I realized that I knew very little about them. So I did a bit of research into them. Um, and I'll start off by talking about the, the, the time when the Christmas carols as we now know them really came about. They were for, properly formulated. Um, and we're going to the year of 1879. And we're going to look at the nine lessons and carols. Prior to that, Christmas carols were starting to be sung in churches. They were still called hymns then, really. Um, and there was no real proper sort of formulation for them as in a service. However, in 1879, uh, oh, and by the way, I always thought this started in King's College, Cambridge. I know other people have thought the same. You're wrong. It actually started uh, in Truro, down in Cornwall, because down there, uh, things were booming, they, they were doing very well, and they wanted a cathedral built. And uh, they got to a chap called John Loughborough Pearson to actually design and build it. Now, there's a tenuous link here with the Nine Lessons and Carols and us here in Red Hill, because John Loughborough Pearson, also 10 years after he'd built Truro Cathedral, did the redesigning work at St John's Church of Red Hill. So we've got a link with, very tenuous, I'll grant you, um, with, the, with the carols itself. Um, so in 1879, the Truro Cathedral was about to be finished. And along with the new cathedral, there's a new bishop, of course, a chap called E.W. Benson. And he arrived and he realised he had a little bit of a problem with the music. They didn't have a formal, formal sort of choir, so he got the local singers together and he started to form the choir, or at least have it formed which was rather nice, but he then found another problem. They also sang in the local pubs, which meant by the time they got to church quite often, um, they were inebriated for the evening song anyway. So he then decided that for Christmas Eve and for the first Christmas service um, of 1879 at the new cathedral, he was going to design a new nine lessons and carols service, which he did. Um, and in order to make sure that they were there and sober, he began at 10 o'clock in the evening, two hours before the midnight mass. And he got them to come along and, and, and sing it. Um, that was really where this all started to, to be put together. The very first carol that is sung is Once in Royal David City. And I can remember very well indeed as a nine-year-old at my very first carol service as a choir boy. Um, being absolutely blown away when our head chorister started singing that solo we went in with the candles lit uh, and it's always stuck with me it's a wonderful wonderful um, carol and so the first carol I'm going to be looking at is Once in Royal David City um, and it's the words were written by a woman Cecile Francis Alexander who was actually a teacher. Cecile um, was from Ireland uh, and a very, very good poet. Um, as a little girl, it was recognised that she could write, and she spent the rest of her life writing. She wrote many, many good hymns, many of which, or several of which we still sing today. She married a chap called the Right Reverend Alexander, who became the Archbishop of Armagh and the Primate of Ireland. When she was going home one day from church, bearing in mind she was a very good teacher, and she was very particular that children should know about the Bible. She spoke to her daughter, who was quite young, and said, what did you think of the service? And she said, well, mummy, rather dull and rather boring. And she said, really? And on quizzing her daughter, she discovered that her daughter had no idea about the creed. So to rectify that, she then set about writing hymns for that to cover the, 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 the parts of the creed that she thought children should know about. From that, we get three wonderful hymns, one of which became a carol. All Things Bright and Beautiful, which looks at the uh, part about uh, the uh, maker of heaven and earth. Then there is, there is a Green Hill Far Away, which she also wrote, which is about the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then our carol, Once in Royal David City, and that's the birth, of course, of Jesus. She was a very devout Christian. She travelled many miles every day, actually, looking after the sick and the poor, providing food, warm clothing and so on. A, a wonderful lady, 
and she left behind a wonderful legacy to the, those people, but she left behind an even bigger legacy to us, and that is wonderful first carol, Once in Royal, David City. Cold is the man who can't love the old mountains of dear Wales. To him and his warmest friend, a cheerful holiday next year. Translated from Welsh, these are the words to the tune of our next carol, Nos Galan, or New Year's Eve, written in about 1870 by John Kerriog Hughes. John Oxenford provided an English text at about the same time with the first line, Soon the whole old year will leave us. But the tune is much older and had been a traditional Welsh song which speaks to the origin of the word carol, a dance. This was originally sung dancing in a round with a harpist in the middle, one dancer dropping out every time they missed a line. These original words were very different from what we sing now. Oh, how soft my fair one's bosom! Oh, how sweet the grove in blossom! Oh, how blessed are the blisses! Words of love and mutual kisses! In between each sung line, the harp would answer with a few bars. This became the fa-la-la we know today. In fact, the folk tune was so well known that Mozart used it as the basis for his 18th violin sonata and Haydn set words by the Scottish poet Anne Grant to make the song New Year's Night with the opening line, Loud, how loud, the north wind blowing. Then in 1862, along came Scottish songwriter Thomas Oliphant, who had a penchant for taking popular songs and adding new lyrics to them, often with no link between the new words and the original. These were published in the book Welsh Melodies with Welsh and English Poetry, Oliphant providing the English words and John Jones the Welsh words, which kept the New Year's Eve theme. The blessed pleasure on New Year's Eve is house and fire and a pleasant family, a pure heart and brown ale, a gentle song and the voice of the harp. Oliphant was honorary secretary of the Madrigal Society and made a bit of a thing out of taking Italian madrigals and adding new English lyrics. 
He also incorporated the harp answers of the folk tune into his arrangement with Falala. Nonsense words between lines was a common feature of 16th century Italian and English madrigals. The resulting text of Deck the Hall has references to pagan traditions of burning yule logs and decorating houses with holly as it encourages the singers to fill the mead cup, drain the barrel and celebrate the passing of the year. For these reasons, Deck the Hall is often referred to as a secular carol, reminding us that many of the current Christmas traditions have their roots in ancient midwinter rituals. The Coventry Carol dates from the 15th century. It is a composed carol, and it is in the standard form of a medieval carol, that is, refrain, verses, and refrain again at the end. It comes from the pageant of the Shearmen and Tailors, one of the few surviving mystery plays from the Coventry cycle. Mystery plays told a Bible story, and each was presented by a particular craft guild, or mystery. Mystery plays were arguably the earliest form of musical theatre, which is essentially a play with music. The tradition runs from the mystery plays through the Elizabethan theatre, particularly the chorister plays, Purcell's semi-operas, the 18th century English operas, which were actually plays with songs, to Gilbert and Sullivan, which in turn were the basis of American musical comedy.
1714, a man called George Whitefield was born in Gloucester. Now his father died when George was two and he grew up a bit of a rogue. Um, he actually got involved with stealing um, and other act and active antics. Um, and as he got to a more mature age, he decided he was going to try to become an actor by profession. Whether he was any good at it or not, we don't really know. But from a little bit later on, he met the Wesley brothers. And he actually became a minister in the Wesleyan church. Became quite a leading light, actually. He obviously was quite a good actor because he was extremely good, apparently, in the, in the pulpit. And he heard uh, a hymn which was written by Charles Wesley, one of the many. Charles Wesley was so prolific. And the particular tune was sung, sorry, it was, it was actually sung to the tune, rather, of Ju uh, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. But it was, in fact, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now, the first, first two lines written by Charles Wesley weren't that straightforward. And so Whitefield actually then changed them to the wording we now have as Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. Now, that, those particular words were written down by, by Whitefield around about 1740, 1750. Uh, they were put to one side, they were kicking around. Uh, we don't know quite where they were, where they were placed, um, but they were certainly in a, in a book which was written about Wesley's music. Now, in 1840, we have to go further forward. This was written actually in two halves. We have to now go to Leipzig in Germany, where one Felix Mendelssohn had written a festive song to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Gutenberg's printing press. The piece, the piece he wrote actually was called The Vaterland in Dynam Gauza. Sorry about the pronunciation there, folks. Um, and that was the tune that he wrote as part of the, the, uh, the, the, the song festival. And that particular tune was picked up in 1855 by a young man called William H. Cummings, I believe in Hertfordshire. And he was an English musician. And he came across the words by Whitefield, obviously written originally by Wesley, but modified by Whitefield. He joined them both together in 1855. And the result was the wonderful carol that we know and love, Hark the Herald, Angels Sing.
At the beginning of the 20th century, in fact, very much at the turn, 1900, 1901, there was quite a revival in this country of folk music. And several of our leading composers, and we had some very good ones at that stage, um, were getting involved with folk music and they were wanting to keep and revive the old traditional stuff. One of them was Vaughan Williams, Ralph Vaughan Williams, living, of course, as we probably realised, down in Dorking, a very local man. Now, Vaughan Williams was very, very friendly indeed all his life with Gustav Holst. They met when they were music students um, as very young men, and they spent a lot of their um, early, t early days around the 1900s to 1903, 1904. They spent a lot of time together discussing folk songs, English folk songs, although Holst was also interested in Germanic ones as well because of his, his parents' background. Holst, of course, was himself English. Um, and Rolf, Rolf, um, William, Rolf well, sorry, beg your pardon, Vaughan Williams um, used to spend a lot of time going out on bikes along with Holst. Um, and Vaughan Williams would spend time going down to all the pubs and clubs, where, well, not so much clubs, but pubs and buildings where these folk songs were being sung. And we know that he travelled out from Dorking um, down to the Forest Green and Rusper, amongst many other places. And whilst he was down at uh, Rusper in the Royal Oak, we know when he was there, he heard a young man called Mr. Garman, who was a labourer by day and a folk singer by, in the evening, a paid one. And Garman was singing uh, quite a lot of very, very traditional Surrey uh, folk songs. One of them was called The Ploughboy's Dream. And this was obviously picked up by Vaughan Williams. We know then that Vaughan Williams also visited a pub in Forest Green, I believe it was actually the Parrot, where he obviously came across Garmin again and once again heard the Ploughboy's Dream. And Vaughan Williams then started setting the text to it. And the text he chose was a, from, written by a chap called Phillips Brook, an American priest, um, and it was put to the tune which was sung by Garmin. Vaughan Williams then harmonised it, he called the tune Forest Green. There's a clue there as to where he finally decided to write it, no doubt. And that was actually published in 1906 in the English Hymnal. And the carol, of course, is the very much loved Old Little Town of Bethlehem. <laughs>
The next carol will be In the Bleak Midwinter. This poem, entitled A Christmas Carol, was written in 1872 by Christina Rossetti. Her brother, Dante Gab Gabriel Rossetti, was one of the founding fathers of the Pre-Raphaelite artistic movement, and there are many portraits of Christina, as she was often a model for his paintings. Throughout her life, Christina had bouts of severe depression. She was deeply religious and never married, declining three proposals for religious reasons. The poem was first set to music as a carol by Gustav Holt in 1906, and later in this version by Harold Drake in 1911, when he was still a student at the Royal College of Music. The carol has an amazing clarity in its message, depicting baby Jesus being content with simple comforts and gifts. The first verse is particularly memorable for the repetition five times of the word snow, emphasising the theme of midwinter.
Now, probably the first carol I ever sang and remembered singing was Away in a Manger. I was age four. I was in a nativity play at school playing the innkeeper. And I had a wonderful line in that. In fact, I didn't have a line. I had a word. When I was asked, is there any room at the inn? I had to say, no. I gave a perfect performance. I can remember being told when I was about 12 regarding this carol, um, and I was at secondary school, that it was originally called the Luther's Cradle Song. And I therefore assumed that it had Germanic origins. Uh, and in fact, I imagine back in late Victorian times that the German parents would be sitting there singing lullabies to their children to try and get them to sleep. But I couldn't have been more wrong if I tried. There's no way that German parents would have been singing this carol to their children because the carol was actually written thousands of miles away in America. It's actually wholly and completely an American carol. I always thought it was, was, was European. It was actually written in 1895, and the first two verses were written by an anonymous writer. Many attempts have been tried to find who it was without any, any success. And the first tune was, set, was written by a chap called William J. Kirkpatrick. That's a famous tune that we all know and love. Now, William Kirkpatrick was actually Irish. Um, born in Ireland, emigrated with his parents when he was a young boy to, uh, to America, where he joined the Episcopal Church. He became a very good composer. He put the words to his tune and produced one of the best love carols around the world. I think actually it's rated at number two on that scale. Now there was another American called James Ramsey Murray, another very prolific composer, who also set a tune to the words it's actually one which is probably preferred more in America than to uh, the one by Fitzpatrick role. And this second tune by Murray was written in 1887. Now he was very much a revered composer and he ascribed the words to Martin Luther. But there's actually no record whatsoever of Luther ever getting involved in this carol. So where Murray got his ideas from, we have no idea. Now, a third verse was added around 1888, and again, its origins are disputed, so I won't go down that path, it's quite lengthy. And um, we're not quite sure who wrote the third verse either. Now this carol became widely used in churches and schools across America um, throughout the late, what we would call the Victorian time, because it wasn't in America, but it was here. Uh, and it arrived in Great Britain around the turn of the century, that's the 19th to the 20th century. It proved then, as now, as great a hit with small children as well as their elders. We all love it, and it is Away in a Manger.
Now the next carol we're going to be hearing will be O Come All Ye Faithful. Now before I go into talking about O, o Come All Ye Faithful, I will talk about the little bit of history leading in, which is, a, which is rather relevant. First off, at the end of the Tudor reign, in about 1550, the Puritans uh, came to the fore, and all secular music was banned from churches. That's to say now the newly formed Church of England, of course. I'll say newly formed, but under the Tudor reign. Tudor reign. So all we would have heard were things uh, of chants, uh, obviously the psalms, uh, and, and other sort of music of that sort. But actually, any secular music was banned, of course. Now, the Roman Catholic Church could still sing secular music, limited, but some. But of course, their problem was they couldn't actually have church services lawfully. So they would meet in secret. Now, one of the Roman Catholic members, in going now, we're moving on now to around about uh, the 17th century, uh, 18th century in fact, we're going on to around about 1730, 1740, was a, there was a chap there called John Francis Wade. Now he realised that, uh, as, as they all did, that you could actually sing a, a Catholic church service in the safety of a foreign embassy chapel because they were exempt by law, they were allowed. And so the chapel that he, he attended was the Portuguese Embassy Chapel in Soho. Now, John Francis Wade was actually a Jacobite. And this is just before the Jacobite Risings, where the, uh, the Stuarts wanted Bonnie Prince Charlie to become the rightful um, um, heir to the throne of England. A lot of conspiracy work going on. John Francis Wade, around about, uh, I think, about 1742, 1743, that sort of time, was putting together with others an idea that they would write a song with code in it. And when the Roman Catholic uh, congregation, that, who were Jacobites, some, uh, quite a few of them, when they heard this, they would know that an uprising was to be called. Well, the wording that they, they chose was to tell people that... Um, O come all ye faithful would be part of the part of the, the, the carol they would hear or the song they would hear and that was to that was addressed to the Jacobites um, and they went on to say about the king and that was to be not Jesus but in fact not Christ the king but in this case the Stuart king Bonnie Prince Charles and the key word here was Bethlehem because that referred to, to London that was the place for these people to come down to that is the story, apparently, of this particular carol, O Come All Ye Faithful. Um, and it's the, the Latin, as you know, is Adeste Fidelis, which means draw near ye faithful ones, which was the code word, apparently, that would be used um, to get these people to come along and join. So, O Come All Ye Faithful, a wonderful, wonderful carol, um, was written as a code uh, to spark off an uprising in England. However, when this was sung first off in around about 1745, which is about the year I think that Bonnie Prince Charles actually arrived in, in Scotland, um, it was sung in, in the embassies, um, but it became very popular with the Protestants of the time because they only had non-secular or uh, yeah, non-secular music to listen to. Good though it was, it was Handel's Messiah, there was Bach's Christmas Oratorio, but they also liked the lighter side as well. Um, so they used to go along to listen to the, what we now know as carols um, being sung. Um, well, Wade was none too pleased when he realised that all sorts of other denominations were coming along to enjoy his carol, which was actually written for a very dark reason. But there we are, that's O Come Were You Faithful, a wonderful, wonderful carol. Mm -hmm. 